Well, uh, hello everybody. Welcome to Fort Knox. I am John Fort, this time with Sanjit Biswas, the CEO and co-founder of Samsara. And um, I always start out asking about today's toughest problem. And I think it's interesting in the context of Samsara. I don't know what you're going to say the problem is, but I do know that we're in a time of inflation right now, which means that people, companies need to pay attention to costs, which means measuring the, the efficiency of physical facilities, the movement of physical goods is important. And that's some of what Samsara does. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, first of all, thanks for having me on the show. Uh, in terms of what we do, as you mentioned, John, we help digitize the world of physical operations. So tying it back to the world's toughest problem right now, it's knowing everything that's going on and then using data to figure out ways to be safer, more efficient, more sustainable. I think there's a lot going on in this world of operations. There's a, a lot of upside from digitization, but figuring out how to make that happen is really where we're focused. And I think where our customers are focused too, because they're just trying to figure out with this new normal, how do you continue to operate smoothly? And there's a lot going on in terms of disruptions in the supply chain, uh, desire from customers to know exactly where everything is, and generally trying to figure out ways to be more efficient. So we're uh, trying to help solve a few of those problems and excited to do that with some new technology. So, so how? Um, are, you, are you literally slapping sensors on things to track where they're going, how they're doing, how efficient they are? Give an example of how you're able to do that. Yeah. So part of what we do is provide sensors and IoT technology. So this Internet of Things movement is really around um, getting low cost sensors out into the physical world. And that's how you collect the data. But really a ton of the value is in the cloud. So sort of like the same way that we use web apps and kind of modern tools, the world of operations is digitizing the same way. They want to get all that sensor data into the cloud, know where things are, know what temperatures are like, know how long wait times are, things like that and use it to optimize their operations. So that data ends up flowing into a bunch of insights and you can do that, you can use uh, things like new route planning techniques. So instead of using a big map on the wall, which is how the industry kind of worked for the last few decades, you can use a digital system instead and find that 5% of efficiency. So that's kind of what we see day to day. So give me an example of um the the sort of way this works say we're talking fuel efficiency mm -hmm. for example did the sensors already exist to be able to measure what needs to be measured um, were those sensors uh, conveniently able to send that data into the cloud were they sending it often enough kind of what's the yeah. tuning that had to happen and you know the technology that needed to be in place to even enable that kind of analysis and change you're talking about yeah, this is actually really interesting to kind of dive into the de details on. So most modern trucks, for example, have fuel sensors. So if you think about the gauge or the dashboard in your car or truck, it tells you the miles per gallon, except that data sort of gets trapped on the vehicle. You can see it on the dash, but it's not going to the cloud. So one of the first things we built was a gateway that would take that data, get it up into the cloud, and then some dashboards and analytics that would help for uh, you know a fleet of 500 or 5,000 trucks help figure out which trucks were the most efficient, either by make or model, or sometimes by driving habit, and then help surface those insights so the, the fleet operators could figure out, hey, you know what, these folks are doing it really well, or these routes are really fuel efficient, or we could kind of do these couple of things to be more efficient. That insight wasn't possible until you connected that data from the truck that was sort of disconnected from the cloud to the cloud and then built the software which makes those insights possible. And that's what seems to me to be so interesting about so many of these different cases and situations is like, yeah, you, maybe you had fuel efficiency data, but again, it was locked onto the truck. Maybe you weren't able to cross reference it with exactly who the driver is based on when their shift is. Do you know who's driving the truck? Do you know where the truck is driving? Do you know, like all of the, do you know what the temperature is, you yeah. know, in that location at the time? Um, so it seems to me that part of it is not just having the data and not just being able to send it into the cloud, but also knowing what other data you need to put exactly. alongside that data <clears throat> to make it most relevant. How, how are you doing that? Yeah, so it is about multiple pieces of data. So, you know, the fuel efficiency is super helpful. It's even more helpful in context. So if you know which routes or and, and with the additional info about the truck, it's even more helpful when you know which driver, right? And so tying all that data together is where the insights really come from. I think uh, the best way that I think about this is through the eyes of our customers. So a good example of a customer of ours would be Arc Best Freight. You may have seen some of their trucks on the road. They're a nationwide freight carrier. They have thousands and thousands of trucks. So they drive millions of miles every week. For them, 
having all this data meant that they could reduce the number of preventable accidents by, uh, you know, in the teens, so about 15%, which is really significant when you think about their scale. They were able to save uh, a ton of money from insurance costs. They were able to keep how? their welfare safe. How, how, yeah. how did this data help them prevent accidents? Yeah, so they were able to see patterns. So they would see, you know, in certain metro areas where traffic is really heavy, it's more likely that you might get into a collision because, you know, the, the highways are packed. So could you plan around those routes? There are certain drivers who, by the way, haven't gotten into an accident in 30 years. So what are they doing? What can they teach the others? And how do you showcase them? So getting the data helped them run a, a, a rewards program where they could showcase their top 10 safest drivers, give them, of course, an award, but also show the other folks the tips and tricks that they have to be safer drivers on the road. So a net positive feedback loop and creating a culture of safety, which is possible, again, driven by the data and the dashboards. Where are we? in um, being able to use this data, not just to make adjustments, but to completely rethink the way um, workflows are structured in the first place. Because uh, I imagine the, the first step is to tweak what already exists. Yeah. But another step is to get so good at gathering and analyzing the data that a customer is able to step back and say, well, wait a second, why are we doing it this way? Why don't we redesign the truck? Right. Yeah. Based on what we've learned, not just, you know, drive the truck differently. Yeah. So we are definitely seeing that. And I, I mentioned ArcBest, another part of the program that they implemented with us was a driver workflow. So they have an app uh, that runs on a smartphone that drivers can use at the beginning of their shift uh, when they're, they're getting started. They're able to save about 50 percent of their time just by doing that on an app instead of, you know, pen and paper, which is the way it's been done for a long time. And once they did that, they said, hey, we could probably provide some more context inf information to this driver about where they're headed, what the stops are like. You know, when you're doing deliveries, for example, there are special instructions nearly for every site, but sometimes you don't visit that site every day. So you have to go call someone to ask. So that's a way that they were able to streamline. And then to your point, John, around, could you just rethink the whole thing? A bunch of these companies have started tying in our data and our APIs to their other systems, their customer databases, things like that to say, hey, can we provide a fundamentally different customer experience where we deliver something directly to their door? So instead of the distribution center, now that we know where the demand is and when it's coming in, let's just bring them the product straight to their doorstep, kind of the way that you know DoorDash has done for food delivery. Could you do that for paint? Could you do it for industrial chemicals? You know, A bunch of the infrastructure that runs behind the scenes doesn't have this kind of modern technology. So that is definitely changing with these new workflows. So since we zeroed in a bit and talked about uh, transportation and, and delivery a little bit specifically, mm -hmm. uh, zoom out for a moment and, and talk about the major industries where your customers are now and mm -hmm. what some of those general applications are. I, I see that you deal in government, maybe some education that's very different yeah. from <laughs> moving trucks around. Yeah. How are sensors or whatever the, the data gathering uh, mode is, how is that used there? Uh, and what kind of efficiencies are possible? Yeah, so we think of it as connected operations. And, and like you said, it's way more diverse and broader than just transportation and logistics. So some of the other industries we work with, field services is a big one. So if you think about all the crews that are out doing work in the field, whether it's uh, landscapers or electricians or pest control companies or elevator repair people, there's all kinds of field services crews out there. Local governments, as you mentioned, we work with uh, like the city of Boston, for example, is using us. And I'm happy to talk about them in a second. Um, and then just to, to kind of keep going down the list, there's food and beverage companies that manufacture a bunch of these products. Uh, there's the energy utilities that provide you know, electricity, there's water utilities and so on. So it's really a, a diverse set of operations. Um, what's common across all of them is there are a lot of people and, and they're doing, um, you know, not just driving tasks, they're doing a lot of other tasks. So there are all these opportunities to use data to streamline. So if we think about uh, state and local government, um, you know, we work with actually the city of Boston and the MBTA, which is the bus uh, authority um, uh, that, that's local to Boston. They use us to make sure that they're operating efficiently on their routes and they can reduce the amount of unplanned downtime. So they just don't want their buses to be out of service makes a ton of sense. They want to make sure they're delivering for their citizens. Um, same thing, a bunch of these municipalities are thinking about electrification. So they have different challenges that they're faced with, and they have a Vision Zero initiative where they want to figure out how do they cut their carbon emissions down to zero as quickly as possible? How do they get their accidents down to zero? Data is the key to doing that. So you can't improve what you can't measure. For us, we are providing that data to municipalities like Boston so they can run their operations more safely, more efficiently, more sustainably. 
What about moving people? Uh, I, I think about what's happening now with uh, hybrid work, with corporate campuses that are no longer as static in terms of who has an office where, who works where. Um, yeah. You know, uh, I, I think uh, ServiceNow recently bought a company whose technology is about mapping out campuses so mm -hmm. that people can find their way perhaps to a new office or perhaps to a different class yeah. location if it's a university campus. And then there are cameras in retail locations now that are tracking what's happening on shelves, how people, customers are moving throughout a store, what they're looking yeah. at or not. Is that the sort of uh, physical movement data and efficiency data that Samsara also would work with to figure out how to make a system more efficient? Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, you, you mentioned a diverse set of applications there. For example, in education, which we, we haven't really gone into, uh, we end up on a lot of the campus fleet. So if you think about a university campus, for example, they want to know where all their shuttle buses are. They want to provide, you know, the next shuttle comes in six minutes and they are fundamentally moving people and they want to provide a better experience to those riders. Um, so that with real time data is much, much easier than having to go decipher one of those, uh, you know, cards that sits on the top, the side of the bus stop. Right. And you don't even know if it's, it's accurate or up to date. Um, that's that's just kind of one example. Student transportation is another one. Um, these are all the school buses. If you think about it, one of the most common calls that the school gets, by the way, is where's my kid? Um, you know, when are they coming home and uh, where's the bus, basically? And so being able to provide real time portals that people, the students and the teachers and the parents can log into to see the bus routes um, in action when the next stop is, that sort of thing. Again, really uh, helpful data, very practical uh, and something enabled by connectivity and sensors in, in real time. Yeah. Uh, really interesting. So I, I want to get back to uh, things about the company specifically mm -hmm. a bit later, but now I want to take a step back and learn more about you. Um, and I like to start at the very beginning. So <laughs> like, where were you born? Tell me about household, parents, any siblings? Yeah, starting at the very, very beginning, I guess. Um, so I was, I was actually born in Canada, but moved to Texas when I was uh, pretty young. My parents, uh, my dad was a professor originally of electrical engineering. So uh, that's kind of uh, my background is, is very much related to his, which is around engineering and computer science. Uh, my mom is an English professor. And so uh, that's kind of the background. Um, getting a little closer to uh, how, how we kind of got started with, with Samsara and our previous company. Um, Let's not move too fast, though. Okay. Uh, any siblings? I do have a sibling. I have a sister who lives out in New York. Um, and so you grew up in Texas the whole time or just for a period of time? Yeah, um, not the whole time. So until I was about 12 and then moved to the Bay Area. And before we got started, John, we were talking about uh, your time at the San Jose Merck. That was my hometown newspaper. And I actually went there to visit uh, when I was on our high school newspaper. So it's it's a kind of funny connection we've got. Wow, that's cool. Um, and uh, the Merck has moved locations a couple times uh, since then. Um, for various reasons. <laughs> um, but I, I, tell me about, so as a kid in Texas and then in the Bay Area, what were you into? Well, um, I don't think this is going to be a terrible surprise, but definitely into computers. Uh, that's that's kind of always been the hobby and, and, and the passion of mine um, and technology. And so uh, if, if I had sort of one hobby that, that sort of spanned that whole time, it would be tinkering with computers and then figuring out how to make them useful for other people. Um, way back in the 1990s, which is now a quarter century ago, uh, I, I was uh, part of a team that helped bring email and internet access to the, the kids in our high school. I think we were probably the second high school in the whole country uh, to have email. And so that's the kind of thing that, that has always gotten me excited. Um, what allowed you the insight to do that? Was it connected at all to exposure that you had through your dad's work or research or study? Were there people or things that sparked your interest in the first place? Yeah, you know, I, I think it's it's hard to know for sure what goes on in the mind of like a 12 year old. But um, for me, I was really lucky that my dad was in this technical area. His his, uh, you know, books and uh, newspapers and trade magazines, all that stuff were always around. So I would kind of flip through them and I would kind of try to learn what was going on. Um, I was also really lucky that I got to just sort of play around with computers, not in the form of a class or something like that, but really as sort of an interest. And I think once you find an interest, you just start kind of pulling on that string. And it just so happened that that was happening in the mid 1990s. The internet was just getting started. It was all kind of free and open. The web browser was just being built. And so it was just really fascinating. I think when you're, uh, when you've got that kind of time, you're able to really go deep and, and start building things. Uh, I started taking newspapers.
newspaper classes in high school in the early early mid nineties. Yeah. Uh, and desktop publishing was really just becoming more of a mature thing. Mm -hmm. And Apple and Adobe were really important companies in that process, and they were right there in the Bay Area, right, where you had yep. just recently moved. How aware were you of that kind of combination <laughs> of um, your household, I imagine, uh, yeah. you know, electronics and English, uh, desktop <laughs> publishing, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, so Apple was definitely a big sort of uh, dominant figure. Uh, I, I basically grew up near Cupertino. So uh, the, the high school that I went to was maybe two miles from the Apple campus. Um, and I think it was it was really great sort of source of inspiration, right? That all these tech companies were around. And it wasn't just Apple and Adobe. You had uh, Cisco Systems, you had Sun Microsystems, you had all these these industry giants that were doing big things. Netscape, if you remember that name. And, and it's funny now, I work with Mark Andreessen, who's on our board. It's just kind of amazing how the world works out. So uh, definitely felt a source of inspiration from there. And you could kind of just feel it in the air. If you wanted to learn about computers or um, the World Wide Web or whatever it was, networking, it was kind of open to you, at least here in the Bay Area in the 90s. And that was a great environment to be growing up in. If you were curious and you wanted to tinker, um, you could basically find those resources, even if you didn't have them at home. It's not like I was able to do all this stuff at home. A lot of it was being done in, at school. Um, and so when all of that was going through your head and you were seeing it, you decided to stay local, go to Stanford? I did, yeah. So I did my undergrad at Stanford, uh, not too far away, and then ended up moving to the East Coast for grad school. Um, what did you think you were going to do with it? Uh, it, it in grad school? Or in yeah. <laughs> um, well, it's, it's funny. You could kind of tell from the lineage and the history. My family is, is from academia, right? We, we have a, a lot of professors in the family. So that was kind of my guess in terms of what I want to do was to go into academic research. And that's kind of what I, I sought out to do. Um, did my undergrad at Stanford, was fortunate enough to get an MIT for grad school, started as part of the PhD program there, which is where I met John, my co-founder. And where did business come in then? Because <laughs> it's not like, you know, you were part of a family of entrepreneurs necessarily. You seem to have very much a research uh, track and kind of yeah. innovation for innovation's sake, perhaps. Um, yeah. where, did, where did the entrepreneurial bug come in? You know, I would have to say we were kind of reluctant or cautious entrepreneurs when we started. So um, the the little bit of background on us, this is this company, Samsara, has been around about six years. We actually did another company before this called Meraki that was actually the outgrowth of our PhD research. So John and I met in the program early 2000s, worked on basically building big wireless networks. This is when Wi-Fi was a new technology. It's actually before it was even called Wi-Fi to, to date us a little bit. Um, but we wanted to make it really easy to build big networks the size of a university campus or a city. And so we built a, a big network out in Boston. And then uh, Meraki actually became a startup in an effort to take that technology, make it easy for other people to build networks. So we've always just been motivated by impact. That's why we did research, why we wrote papers, shared our insights. And Meraki was a way to take that technology, literally put it in a box so other people could deploy networks. And uh, we ended up connecting it to the cloud to make it easy. And that's what unlocked uh, the previous startup. And happy to talk about that more, but uh, yeah, it was let's, an exciting kind of transition for us. Because you know, I was covering um, technology and Silicon Valley and, and wireless during that time when you were uh, doing the research and Meraki was launching and all of that. Yeah. Uh, at, at what point did it transition from being, here's some great research that we're doing that we should hand over to some company to take over and scale to yeah. actually now maybe we need to build the company to do this ourselves. Yeah, you know, it's funny because we sort of tried that first approach, given that we were kind of reluctant entrepreneurs. We we basically uh, open sourced all of our research. It was available on our website. We published papers about it. And we thought, uh, being academics, that you kind of put the ideas out there and the world will run with them. Um, but, you know, there's still some activation energy required to go from those ideas to technology that people can really deploy and use. And that's when we realize the magic of products. If you can make it easy, like if you can make it plug and play, in other words, people will, will get going with it in, in a much faster way than having to download the software or read an academic paper 
and write it up themselves. M most people can't actually do that. They don't have the time or they don't have the technical expertise. So that was the unlock for us was realizing that. And in 2006, we thought it was going to be a summer project, by the way. We thought Meraki would be something where it was like a proof of concept or a demonstration. But in the first, I, I think in the first 90 days, the first three months that summer, uh, we sold out all of the product that we had. And uh, we hadn't even raised any venture money or anything. It was a bootstrap company by a bunch of grad students who didn't have enough, any money of our own. And that to us was the sign that there was something there that making products and making systems that were easy for people to deploy was really, really compelling. And that's how uh, we started running with Meraki. Somebody must have told you, uh, you know, since you sold out of all of this and since you're bootstrapped, maybe you should get somebody to give you some money. Right. When was that conversation? <laughs> we did get the hint. We actually this is kind of ancient history for me, but our first customer at the time uh, or one of them was Google. And so we were partnering closely with them. They were talking about doing free Wi-Fi um, all over the city of San Francisco and around the world. Um, they were a, an early partner of ours, ended up investing a little bit of money, kind of a seed capital. But at that point in time, Sequoia Capital, who's a well-known VC, uh, did find us and they convinced us, you know, you've got a great idea here. You should accelerate. You should hit the gas. And to do that, you're going to need some capital. So they became our Series A investor way back in 2006. What did convincing look like? <laughs> um you know, I, I think we 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 understood the value of being able to accelerate. So it's not that we were completely uh, against it or something like that. For us, it was about finding uh, kind of a long term partner, and this is something that has become a core value of ours: is thinking long term. I think we knew it intuitively, and so we liked um, their investor profile and and the companies they'd helped build. And we knew that if we were going to build a, a company here, it wouldn't be an overnight project; it would be something that took years. And so that's something we looked for back then. How did you guys decide that you were the CEO? <laughs> um, well, you know, I think it was maybe process of elimination. Most of the other folks were building the product and, and, and uh, writing the software. I was actually helping get the products manufactured. Um, I helped work with Google. So I was a little bit of that interface to uh, the outside world. But given my technical background, I was able to kind of keep one foot in both. And as an early stage company, that was really helpful. Um, and then as we got bigger, uh, I found that I really enjoyed the communication side of things. I enjoyed spending time with customers. And so it's kind of just been a natural fit since then. Yeah, that made me wonder. I mean, how much of it was that communication background? You mentioned that trip to the Merck uh, in, in high school. Um, yeah. You know, not everybody's comfortable not only working on the product, but also talking about the product and, you know, all, all that comes along with it. Were you more comfortable with that? Uh, again, sort of maybe in the context of our group uh, among the more comfortable because the other folks really wanted to spend their time writing code. I'm sure you could have found someone with more of a sales background or business development background. I, I have to be honest with you. Our first uh, customer order, customer got super excited. The, and, and this was actually the meeting at Google. They said, hey, this technology is really great. Uh, we want to give you a PO for a thousand units. And I said, wow, that's exciting. What's a PO? <laughs> like, it's a purchase order. Uh, I was like, okay, great. Uh, and then I, I remember getting the paperwork. I was like, how do I cash this thing? Like, <laughs> so there was definitely a lot of learning that happened in those first couple of years. But, you know, I, I think the, the good news is if you have the interest, uh, you can figure these things out. And that's another thing that we really focus on is this growth mindset, figuring things out as you go. Um, you sold to Cisco. We did. And then you were there. Uh, for a couple of years. Mm -hmm. What did you learn from that experience, either from being at Cisco, which is at a different scale, yeah. or about um, maybe not wanting to sell and wanting to continue to run a company longer term? Yeah. So um, we sold Meraki in 2012 to Cisco. And um, part of it was it was a strategic decision for us because we wanted to go and have that massive scale impact. We'd scaled Meraki over the years. We were doubling in revenue. Um, I think we were about $100 million in revenue, if I remember correctly, when we sold. So we, we, we'd gotten to some significant scale. But Cisco was the household name in computer networking. Basically, every, every business, uh, especially at a global scale, was familiar with them. And they had a route to get to those companies. It was going to take us decades to build that. And so for us, it was a partnership opportunity more than anything else to see our products go into that channel. And that's what we spent the first couple of years doing, post-acquisition we wanted to keep the magic going. And so we continued to grow the business. We had some great partnership with the execs at Cisco who helped make the deal happen. And they invested in the business. It continued to grow very, very fast. And um, by the time we were leaving, 
uh, it was it was on its uh, track to get to over a billion dollars in revenue. And I think they're in the billions now. I'm not sure about the exact numbers. But revenue aside, in terms of number of networks, uh, I think it's been announced Meraki serves over three million networks. We started with one network in Boston, right, in 2006. And so to go, see it go from one to tens of thousands to, to millions was really fulfilling. And so to us, that was an amazing journey. And it took about 10 years kind of end to end. Yeah. Well, what, why did you leave? And what happened in those months in between leaving Cisco <laughs> and starting Samsara? Yeah. Um, so, you know, I think as entrepreneurs, you're, you're kind of used to doing everything yourself, right? Especially as a founder. Uh, in the early days, it's leasing the office, it's taking out the trash, it's buying burritos for everyone. It's, it's kind of all of that stuff. In the later days, it's being able to control all the financials, the roadmap. We knew that as part of, as part of Cisco, in order for the business to be successful over the long term, it needed to connect in to the rest of the company, which means spending time with teams all over the place, getting all the finance systems hooked up. And we knew that that was not our natural superpower, right? Um, there are some people who are really great at that. We were better at building the technology, kind of getting things off the ground, and then just kind of orchestrating everything on our own. So it started to feel pretty apparent to us, but we wanted to see it keep going. So as that feeling became clear, we started working with the same sponsors and just were very transparent with them of eventually we're, we're going to want to um, do something else. But we did something we call the process of evaporation. So little by little, we handed things off. And I think by the time we left, I don't not sure anyone noticed. And that was kind of by design. <laughs> uh, but in terms of other stuff that was going on, um, uh, my wife and I, we had our first uh, child back then in 2014. So as a new dad, um, it took some time off for that. And it was actually just a very natural break point. It felt like we had accomplished our phase of the mission uh, in terms of getting Meraki to some scale. I hadn't really taken a lot of time off uh, during that uh, pretty intense journey. So it was nice to just get you know, some family time, a bit of a break, uh, ended up taking a, a, a few vacations, which was great. And it was a, a bit of a mental reset where you say, okay, I feel like we accomplished something really significant. What next? And we didn't actually know we were gonna do Samsara. We thought, hey, maybe, you know, this sounds funny, but maybe go back and finish that PhD because we dropped out of the program. Uh, so I actually wrote academic papers and then realized that feedback loop was, was too slow for us. Like we were addicted to instant feedback with customers, right? Being able to build something, hand it to them, see it solve a problem. And we missed that. And so that's what kind of got us going again for Samsara was he said, we love having impact. Is there something we can do that, that's, that's a contribution, a positive change for society where you can use our IT background to, to go do something good. And Samsara ended up being uh, the logical answer to that. Uh, and, and I'm happy to talk about the markets, but um, for us, it really was about impact. And we felt like we'd done a lot in IT. Could we do something in another part of the world? What got you from moving bits to moving atoms? <laughs> uh, it's not like you started in you know, trucking or logistics or something, saw the problem from within a particular industry and decided to solve it. Uh, I, I, I wondered, you know, looking at that, it's like, well, how do you decide to to narrow down and solve that specific kind of problem? It's it's different. Yeah. It's it's very different. And you know, I think it it kind of connects back to that sense of curiosity um, that we've had really since the early days, maybe going back to high school, who knows? Um, but we were fascinated by this world of infrastructure and and operations. And just for context, by the way most people don't get a chance to step inside a warehouse or kind of look behind the curtain of infrastructure, but it's 40% of the US GDP, right? If you think about the number of people involved in our supply chain and food and beverage and utilities and so on, it's really massive. So we were really curious about that area. And we actually gotten a little bit of exposure to it from Cisco and Meraki because they all needed networking equipment. So we would get a chance to visit some of these manufacturing facilities, some of these distribution facilities. And we noticed a lot of pen and paper, to be honest, and it kind of made us scratch our heads. And it made total sense because if you step back at least, you know, five, 10 years ago, there weren't a lot of people building new technologies for those customers. There's a lot of interest in consumer, right? The Facebooks and the Instagrams and the YouTubes and so on. A lot of interest in enterprise software. Um, but we didn't know anyone else in Silicon Valley working on uh, software and technology for these customers. So we kind of started with that idea of could you have impact there? And then um, the other thing we were kind of looking at was you know, in terms of the scale of operations and infrastructure, we were also uh, kind of starting to think about sustainability and some of these other big, big pressing global scale issues. And could we have a positive impact there? And if you think about it, actually 60% of the energy use in the US goes into transportation and industrial 
uh, operations. It's, it's the majority of the energy. And so if you can figure out a way to make things, call it 3% more efficient, it's massive, right? It, it really has a needle moving impact. And again, you know, this is kind of why we got into academic research. We wanted to try to build cool new technologies that could have some impact. And so that's kind of what got us into this market. Did you start building immediately? Uh, <laughs> did, what was the first thing you were designing? Um, so given that we were outsiders to this world of operations, we wanted to have conversations with uh, prospective customers. We wanted to basically talk to some beta customers. It's hard to do that uh, unless you bring something to the table. So we said, okay, let's just, let's try something. Let's make our best guess. And we, we thought a cloud connected sensor would be different and, and useful. So we actually built the simplest sensor that we could, which was a cloud connected temperature sensor. And we thought this might be useful in the world of uh, food and beverage, or maybe biotech and pharmaceuticals where they have temperature sensitive, either food or assets. And, um, you know, maybe we could help them detect that a commercial refrigerator failed uh, before, you know, a bunch of stuff got ruined and, and provide some alerts and text messages and stuff. So that was our first product, if you will. Uh, we took that to about, I think it was about a dozen uh, beta customers here around the Bay Area. So local folks that we could just chat with. Um, and it was really eye opening because it turns out our first guess, even though we built products and, and done a lot of this before, was just not not right. It, it was kind of a little off. Turns out commercial refrigerators in 2015 just didn't fail. They were actually very good. Huh. Uh, but these beta customers ended up taking our temperature sensors and redeploying them onto their delivery vans. And so we said, wow, that's really fascinating. Why is that? And it turns out that that was the weakest link in the supply chain. They had really great visibility and, and reliability in their facility. But then once the products left, uh, once they had to be transported to either distribution or retail location, all bets were off. You didn't know where uh, the products were. You didn't know if they were kept at temperature. Uh, just the data was missing. And so the customers actually led us to uh, what became our first big application, which is GPS tracking. Uh, was that uh, process of figuring out what the product was, something that you would learn previously, either through Meraki or time at Cisco? Um, was it just the natural evolution of your curiosity? Because some people would have um, either tried to force the original idea and, and ended up with maybe a very narrow niche product or um, would have just given up. Yeah. You know, I think this customer feedback loop concept is something we started learning at Meraki. It's, it's how we developed our feature roadmap. We were fortunate because we had a background in computer networking. We were able to sort of intuitively guess a lot of the features that the customers would need. And, and then we kind of refined them based on feedback from the customers in terms of how they wanted to integrate them in their business, things like that. Operations was kind of the next level. We were not folks that had a, a operations background. So we were starting with really a blank sheet of paper and we knew that whatever guess we had was probably wrong. And so we were very open-minded in terms of running that feedback loop. Um, so I, I think that that was kind of maybe the fundamental reason, but we went into it with this idea that we wanted to basically go find the most important problems as opposed to just push the technology. We started market first instead of technology first, in other words. It's kind of meta to me because what you're enabling with Samsara's technology is feedback loops on physical things, mm -hmm. right? And their movements or operations. <laughs> but at the same time, you needed to create a feedback loop for, for knowledge and ideas in order yeah. to figure out what the product was in the first place, right? Yeah. And this, by the way, has become our number one uh, cultural principle inside the company is running this feedback loop with customers and it didn't just result in one application or product. I mentioned GPS tracking was the first application we came up with. At the very beginning of the conversation, we were talking about driver safety. That became something that actually became apparent after the company started, because at that point in time, everyone had the smartphone in their pockets, folks were getting distracted on the roads, and these big operations companies were trying to figure out, hey, how do we improve safety? This is kind of going in the wrong direction. We've been spending decades getting better at safety. All of a sudden, it started going uh, the opposite direction could technology help so that became a conversation with the customer which then led to uh, uh, outward facing dash cameras which led to us adding ai to it uh, which led to workflows so these were things that we did not start with we didn't even have an idea that they might be on the roadmap the customers basically helped us find the way through and it was a partnership because many of them didn't even know it was possible most fleet companies didn't know what was possible with ai and new chips and so it was really a very cool sort of back and forth process Often I'd save questions from the audience for the end, but 
the NFL season has started, so I'm going to call an audible. Uh, and this one is right along the lines of what you were just now talking about from Roland De Silva, frequent uh, Fort Knox viewer mm-hmm. and participant. Uh, and he asked, do you see Samsara leveraging the operations cloud to enable greater efficiency for machine learning, artificial intelligence operation, and or a precursor to digital twinning of infrastructure assets and operations by leveraging the data capabilities? Yeah. So um, to answer Roland's question, absolutely. We, I would say we're kind of at the 1% complete point when it comes to digitizing operations. Getting this data into the cloud helps you look at it in aggregate. You can use that data to train AI models. So I mentioned uh, safety. Uh, with our dash cams, we're able to build models of what's the right following distance between trucks right, to help avoid accidents. You can only do that when you see hundreds of thousands or millions of miles driven uh, from the cloud. And so that helps train our models. But as you're building that, you can actually build basically a digital twin of that truck, right? So you can understand what's the fuel efficiency like? Is it better uh, in certain environmental conditions? You know, is it better uh, with certain driver profiles, that kind of thing? And so absolutely, I think uh, this data then lends itself to AI and ML and optimizing. Uh, And then I think we will see some new use cases, new insights, and maybe even uh, preventative maintenance. That's something that we're starting to invest in, the idea that you know, with enough data, you could probably see a problem before it happens, right? You could see, you know, uh, the check engine light equivalent uh, for a number of different things. And so we're starting to surface those insights to our customers. Interesting. Um, I've heard uh, others talk about doing that and and Mm -hmm. exciting to see it starting to happen. Mm -hmm. Uh, Now I want to ask a question that I always ask because I think there's so much uh, wisdom to be found here, and that's about Death Valley. what I call uh, your lowest point career-wise. Um, was there a time when you hit a wall in one of your efforts and thought, um, well, this is it. Uh, <laughs> maybe maybe we need to hang this up. Maybe I need to try something yeah. else. Uh, and, and, you know, it was just really difficult. Yeah, you know, I think um, every startup goes through challenging phases. And it, it's funny you mention it as Death Valley. You know, I think many startups have multiple Death Valleys. And it's It's just part of the experience. Like sometimes you hit a wall, you have to just kind of back up and try something else. Um, For us, you know, this is a relatively recent experience, but 2020 uh, is not that is not that far behind us. It was incredibly challenging. Right. If you think about March of 2020, what it felt like uh, as a high growth company going into that, we weren't sure what the world looked like, obviously, from a safety perspective for employees. We didn't know what it meant for our customers in the world of operations. these aren't high margin businesses. And so we were worried about uh, the world economy and what might happen. And so I wouldn't say it was, it was Death Valley for the company necessarily, but it was a lot of uncertainty. And, and you know, you can kind of freeze up or lock up as a leader. And so for me personally, I had to figure out, OK, which way is which way is up? Uh, how do we guide the company through this? How do we put ourselves on the most stable footing, both internally and externally? And figuring that out wasn't easy when you've got all the chaos going on in the world uh, around you at that time as well. So what did you do? There was pressure to lay people off. There was pressure to do all kinds of things. And at the time in March, April, um, very few people imagined that three months later, right, there would be this demand surge that would then catch a lot of probably these very same customers off guard. Yeah. So, you know, we had to basically try to get as much data of our own as possible about, you know, what's going on with customers and, you know, what the business might look like. Uh, For us, it was actually, uh, it it wasn't great. At the beginning of the pandemic, we basically saw a lot of orders freeze because people said, hey, if we remember the global financial crisis of a little over a decade ago, the economy didn't do so well. Supply chain companies had to kind of contract, like uh, contract their operations, things like that. Um, So we, we sort of went into it assuming Uh, a big recession, maybe even a depression, if you remember that word word being thrown around. Um, And then, you know, what did happen three months later was the stimulus, right? And and this idea that, um, you know, people actually need more visibility in their supply chains and people need products delivered to their home. So we we saw that resurgence happen probably 90 to 120 days later. And uh, that was that was kind of a whiplash moment for the company. But then we started to say, okay, well, how do we retool our product and our offerings and the way we do business um, for this this kind of new world that we're in. What did that do to you first, and then I guess for (laughs) you, but what did that do to you as a CEO, as a a leader, Um, those hard decisions up front about whether and how to reposition the company? um, Mm -hmm. How did you make that decision? Were there 
uh, was it hard? Were there things you got wrong? Yeah, absolutely. So I, I think there it was definitely hard. Um, we were also doing it at a time, we had a, a pretty vibrant in-office culture. We were headquartered in San Francisco, we have a pretty big hub that we built up in Atlanta. London was our European headquarters. And so the company also went distributed, right? And we're still operating in distributed mode. And to be honest, it's worked way better than any of us thought. And I think you've probably heard that from other CEOs, but that was a moment of stress, which was, we had this awesome culture. It was very informal. People could just swap notes in the hall and you know, it, it, we didn't have a lot of meetings. Uh, and so we had to change how we communicated internally. And that pivot um, went really well. And we've continued kind of along those lines. Same thing with onboarding new employees. As we started to invest in the business and, and hire new people, um, I would say, I, I don't know the exact number, almost 40% of the folks at Samsara have joined us post pandemic. So figuring out how do you onboard, how do you build culture um, when it's done mostly over video uh, was definitely a challenge. And then the customer interactions, as I mentioned, operations, very physical, right? Like you want to get out on site, see how things work. Uh, we weren't able to visit our customers in the same way. And so we had to figure out, can we do uh, Zoom calls? Can we do ride-alongs that way? Uh, how do we do this safely? And so being able to continue to run the feedback loop in this new model was really challenging. But once we figured it out, we actually saw some cool server linings. Like I could now meet with a customer in Germany, in New York, in uh, you know California on the same day which before just wouldn't have been as common because people weren't as comfortable over video. So I, I do think there was some adaptation that occurred, but in the end, I think we came out on top because we ended up with some new tools. And uh, by the way, in terms of workforce, we now hire remote folks all over. Our talent pool just got a lot broader. So between the customer interactions and our access to talent, I do think that this um, sort of hitting refresh of how we do business has been good for us. How do you tell the difference between something that worked during a difficult, sort of a global and universally difficult period, yeah. uh, that's a good you know, adaptation, versus something that's a learning that's gonna continue to be applicable, whatever the conditions are in the future, whether it's you know, hybrid work or hybrid customer visits, or how do you decide whether, oh, well that worked during the pandemic, or no, this is gonna be our new philosophy or way of doing business. Yeah. I don't have a perfect answer for you other than it is around running feedback loops and, and not being rigid in your thinking, actually being the opposite, being flexible and adopting different ideas. As we think about how we're going to uh, work in the future, now that we have so many folks who are remote and it's working well, we want to find a way to keep that going, right? At the same time, we have folks who are eager to get back to an office once it's safe. And so we're going to have some offices available. It's it's however people want to get their jobs done is is how we plan to work in the future, but we need to make sure we continue to communicate well. So I think the norms will change, right? The, it's, it's, gonna, it's hard for me to imagine that things go back to the way they were two or three years ago entirely, right? Um, I, I think we are, as a society, adapting to this new wor way of working and this flexibility is, is great. So it's probably some, somewhere in between the extreme uh, work from home culture that we were sort of forced into during the most dangerous periods of the pandemic and the you know, very office-centric cultures that existed um, prior to. For you as a founder, as a CEO, um, was there a core belief that has kind of carried through from that Death Valley experience? Very often I find whatever it is that gets you through that difficult time becomes a tool in the toolbox that you can uh, use from there on out. Has there been? Yeah. Um, I think when you go through one of those Death Valley experiences, you figure out uh, again, which way which way is up, what really matters, and what in, in the business context really drives the business, right? And so we got very crisp in terms of what were we doing in terms of bringing value to our customers and how do we do more of that? And so making sure we are uh, not slowing down, in fact, amplifying uh, what's working for us, because that's ultimately how businesses grow. You do more for your customers, you find more customers and, and so on. And then internally, I think uh, the communications piece uh, has been super important, especially in distributed mode. I'm even more available now. I was always happy to chat with people, but again, it was only the people I could probably bump into in the office. Now I'm available on Slack, on text. We do ask me anything sessions pretty often inside the company. We do more town halls. So I do think we came out of that Death Valley with a better understanding of what was important, what was driving the success, and how do you go focus on that uh, more than anything else. Um, now, as, as we draw this to a close, tell me about uh, priorities. Um, 
in you know heading out of 2021 into 2022 what are those areas where samsara is going to be able to have uh, maximum impact uh hopefully as we begin to emerge from a pandemic though yeah you know we can't call that too soon yeah so our biggest priority is the follow-through right i think given the the sort of relative um age of our company, we're, we're six years in, we've had tremendous impact, we've gotten to some significant scale. But when we think about the rest of the market opportunity ahead of us, we're only a few percent penetrated. And so if I think about fleets, for example, which we talked about a little bit earlier, or we talk about warehouses or, or other parts of operations, and I, I think about 100 uh, commercial vehicles on the road, only 40 of them have any kind of uh, cloud connectivity built into them. Only maybe five of them have a camera. Only a handful of them have a Samsara product on there. So we see the opportunity to, to continue to grow, right, uh, very significantly. And a lot of it is I think many people don't know that these technologies exist. Uh, they, they know how they could be useful to have real-time visibility and understand where everything is and get AI insights and so on, but they don't know how to do it. And so what we need to stay focused on is the follow-through and then continuing to run that customer feedback loop because this world is changing, right? I think now... Everyone has gotten used to real time. Amazon has trained all of us to, to want to know where is something up to the minute. Um, as that happens, how can we stay aligned with that, help serve our customers, build them the technology they need to stay on top? Same thing with safety. Uh, I think people have a heightened expectation of safety because they know the technology is out there to help them avoid accidents, for example. And then last, sustainability. I think that's the other piece. Uh, that is now becoming front and center with everything going on in terms of environmental impact, people trying to cut carbon emissions. They need more data. They need to be able to measure all of this uh, carbon uh, so they can go improve their footprint. We want to serve that. And so that's kind of where we're focused is really around that safety, efficiency, and sustainability. Last time you were running your startup and you were six years in and looking at an opportunity to scale, you sold the company um, mm -hmm. because you could get to scale and impact faster that way. Is it going to be different this time? <laughs> I think it is a little different this time, mainly because there's not a Cisco systems equivalent in our market. There's no company that's done this where we can take our products and, and put it into their channel. We are building that. It's it's a it's a big effort, right? It's, it's going to be multi-decade. Um, but for us, we built a sustainable business. It's growing very, very quickly. It's very healthy. And so uh, we're excited to keep doing this uh, indefinitely. I think we have we have a lot of work to do. Uh, well, there's certainly a lot of goods moving and people who are very concerned with knowing where they are, how they're doing, uh, how to do it more efficiently. Again, in this time of inflation, boy, uh, costs matter a lot. Sanjit Biswas, uh, co-founder, CEO of Samsara. Thanks for joining me on Fort Knox. Great. Thank you, John.